to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it. We have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to A Well-Designed Business. Bregan Jane is back on the show. If you listen to her first episode here, number 362, then you know she is one heck of a hashtag smart lady. And if you haven't listened to it, it will be in the show notes. Bregan is so authentic, and I was so happy to run into her at last high point in October 2023 because I've been wanting to have her back on the show. Bregan has not only increased the number of hats that she wears since the last time she was on the show, but I've been watching her build her brand and her business. Bregan resides in Southern California with her two sons. She is an accomplished interior designer, entrepreneur, brand influencer, children's book author, real estate investor, philanthropist, and TV personality. How's that for like a stack of cred, right? And I mean, the list actually goes on. Bregan has been featured on networks including HGTV, Food Network, Max, and more. You may recognize her as the host of HGTV's Dream Home. In addition to everything Bregan does, she is always up to the minute on what is on trend and up and coming in interior design and home decor. And wait until you hear about her global humanitarian efforts and her work with the Makuno Project. In the first episode with Bregan, we went kind of everywhere. She shared aha moments, client advice, her favorite types of projects, and what it means to her to be both a mom and an entrepreneur. There was one line that I remember that was so powerful that I'm even going to include it in my goodie for this show. And that was to take your pain or fear along with your talents and use them as the fuel that allows you to grow. This line can apply to anything and everything and even about what we'll talk about today. Today, we talk about making shifts and Bregan agrees that shifts can feel risky, but they're usually worth the risk. Before we hear from Bregan, I wanted to make sure you heard the news that the Power Talk Friday Tour is back. What is the Power Talk Friday Tour, you ask? Well, this is a one-day, hands-on, in-the-weeds coaching event that is literally a game changer for your business. You can be any level business owner. You can be an interior designer, a window treatment professional, an interiors photographer, a copywriter, or a web developer for the industry. If you run a creative business and you get value from this podcast, then the Power Talk Friday tour will blow your mind. The components designed into the tour give the value to the newest business owner, to the most seasoned business owner, and everyone in between, specifically the way the day is structured for so much close group, close knit conversation time. All right. It's a full day with me, five to seven experts together, beginning from breakfast all the way through celebration di- dinner with group discussions, round tables, plenty of opportunity for that one-on-one time with each other, with me and the experts. You will leave with your questions answered, lifelong connections made, and an action plan for your business. The first stop on the tour is April 5th, 2024 in Dallas, Texas. The Vincennes, Kay Whitaker, Kathleen Anderson, Michelle Williams, and Andrea Libros will all be there to offer their insights for you on how to take your business to the next level. Go to powertalkfriday.com to learn more and to register. Space is limited. We are not overselling an event like this. It's designed to be small. So head over and get your ticket, powertalkfriday.com. All right, here is Bregan. Hey, Bregan, thanks so much for joining me again on A Well-Designed Business. 
It feels so great to be back and with so much going on. <laughs> I know. I know. I, I like live vicariously through you and your Instagram and watching you and Kensington and Kingsley uh, just travel the world and do your things and your brand partnerships and stuff. And I'm so glad that, um, A, that we ran into each other at High Point and we're like, girl, lady, we got to do this again. <laughs> We have so much more to talk about. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I think what I love most, Regan, is um, I've had, you know, half a dozen interactions with you. I had you on a panel one time. We did the other episode together. Um, the thing is, you are so real. And, you know, that kind of can sound cliche. And But I've met a lot of people. I've done more than a thousand interviews, I'm going to tell you. And... I'm not, and I will tell you by and by, the greatest majority have all been good humans. But there is a willingness on your part to literally speak from the truth. And when I asked you today, what would you like to talk about? I'm going to tell you guys. She said, you know, I think we should talk about how as your business changes and grows, there's risks. And it's not always to navigate them and to figure them out. And it kind of, is not always easy. And I thought, well, yay, high five for you. Because most people in your position be like, let's talk about how fabulous I am this month. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to do that too. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and social media is where we do that. But I think having real conversations <laughs> is where we can be honest in our vulnerability and be like, okay, everything you see is something that has taken effort. Um, and my business takes a lot of my effort and I love it dearly, but we have ever evolved. Yeah. Yeah. So you were running me through a little bit and, and then I said, no, 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 save it for the show. But you were just, just like the outline of it was that, you know, initially you open up your business and you're an entrepreneur and you're a full service interior designer. It's all about clients. And then there was yep. a shift into TV. And you yep. were saying, I had to navigate clients in TV. And then from there, there was a shift into influencer branding. And now the newest uh -huh. shift is into licensing. And so yep. talk to me. What do you want to tell me about this, this evolution, this shifting, this vulnerability of going from one to another? Well, and I'll even add to it. Even before that, before the clients was my ability to do a flip on my own and see oh. and realize my own talents. So it really has, Brig and Jane as a company has gone through so many growing pains in the evolution of who I wanted to become. Um, the crazy amazing part is I remember having this business, having two very little kids. Um, I was in an apartment cause I was building my own house and, uh, I had a bunch of girls working for me and we would sit around the conference table with like our one-year-olds literally crawling around in the conference room <laughs> of this apartment. Getting it done. <laughs> and Getting it done. And uh, I always loved having moms on my team and they would look at me and be like, well, I'll talk to my partner about childcare. And I was like, forget childcare. Just get this list done with me, please. <laughs> but I remember sitting there and saying, Okay, so we are building a brand, and um, one day uh, this is going to be like Martha Stewart. <laughs> mm. And, like, I think back to the audacity of that thought. <laughs> right? And, but, and um, I really knew that I wanted to be a brand that could touch more than I was able to physically work on their projects. I wanted to build something that had a voice, that had um, an ethos, that had a brand awareness that was built on, you know, my idea of what that was going to be um, and hopefully very empowering. So I kind of reverse engineered my career, so to speak, and looked at the people that were successful in licensing and they always had TV because oh. you need the audience. Oh. Um they're always experts in their craft. So this has not been a fast road for me. This has been a long road of understanding all facets of design, you know, and then being willing to say, I don't know, you know, I just, I just launched a lighting collection. Can I tell you how to make a light specifically from like the engineered interiors? No, I need a bigger partner who understands that. And then I can go, well, I think the 
the shade should be a little bit more like this. And I think we should do one that's non-directional. And I'm really interested in natural materials. What can we get in the area? And working with partners is, and being willing to ever learn, I think, is a part of that realness and vulnerability that you pick up on. You know, what's interesting about what you said is like my brain went right to how you described how you reversed engineered it. And I love because, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, what I love is when I see somebody do something that is, oh yeah, that's actually the way you're supposed to do things. You start with the end in mind, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. you know, we all know this, we've heard it a thousand times. Where do you want to go? And let's figure out how to get there. Right. But to, for you to, I think a lot of us could look at you and be like, so you were just a fabulous designer. And then from there, some TV station said, hey, you're so pretty and you're so personality and you've got these great designs. Let's put you on TV. And then from there, the influence. But to think about, I want to be here, Martha Stewart-esque brand. And that means at some point I'm going to need licensing. But in order to have licensing, I have to have audience. In order to have audience, well, I could do it the long way with a blog, but I could get a TV show. So let's put TV show on the line. Like, it's crazy. And we did do blog, by the way. One of the things I've, I've constantly been since the beginning through all of these is a content creator. Yes, Uh, I see the lifestyle blog that you have there. Yeah. Yeah. My first website was like, you know, 12 years ago, I don't, I don't know, but I made myself blog every week for a year before I allowed myself to purchase and invest in a website. Because I was like, what use is it if you're not going to feed it content? Um, So I, I am a little bit of a uh, glutton for punishment and making myself earn (laughs) my stripes in my own mind. No, see um, right there, just like I, I am blown away again. We're, what are we? I got to look at this counter. Seven minutes into this, for crying out loud. <laughs> like, like, wait a minute. So, like, think about what you just told us that you had a deal with yourself that you must blog every week for a year before you allowed yourself to build and launch the website. I mean, that is, see, that's what I love, really. Every time I talk to you, Bregan, I always learn how intentional an entrepreneur you are, how dedicated you are, um, that it isn't just throwing spaghetti at the wall. And it isn't, a, look, we, I have the saying on the show, you got to be prepared to be lucky, right? And so that is being prepared to be that's- lucky right there. Like I will have a year's worth of content so that I'm lucky when my website gets found on the internet. Right. Remarkable. Uh, Very much so. Very much so. Um, constantly being available for the opportunities that I want. Yeah. And, and what you're doing is you're consistently by that reverse engineering, you're manufacturing what you need to be there so that the opportunity is the right one. And that other partner sees it. Like, I don't know what conversations that you've had in the industry, but I do know that many, many do think you just do good work and somebody taps you on the so- on the shoulder to do these other things. And when you talk to someone like yourself that has achieved it at a ridiculously accomplished level and you learn, oh yeah, I wasn't just designing waiting for somebody to find me. It's it's very eye-opening, I think. It it um I think all of us that are there recognize that in each other. And I think it is our duty, like you through this podcast, to really be honest and let other people know. Um, You know, I've had friends come up to me at High Point and be like, Regan, you're going to be so mad at me. But it's like the best compliment because then they share something vulnerable or a mistake that they've made. Mm. And I'm like, girl, no, you didn't. Like, (laughs) we got to do this. We got to do that. Like, my friends know to come to me for that real support where I'm going to push them you know, and be like, how do we get to your goals? And, and um, I think that that is something that I've received in my career or through mentorships. And it's something I want to continue to give. And uh, this, this business, these things, it's ever changing, you know, it's we're all going to work with the same brands. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right, right. So, so the thing about it is, is that you mentioned, 
you mentioned the the transitions are risky, right? They're risky to make the decision. That's risky. That's a moment of stomach punch and gut check and that. And then there is the I'm in the middle of it and I haven't quite seen it work out yet risk. So talk to me about how you've evolved and despite reverse engineering, despite understanding the steps, that hasn't taken away that feeling of, okay, we're throwing the dice, right? And, and my, my automatic reaction goes to the hardest part of those transitions is letting go and not having it defined as failure because to transition, right? Like typically you go, well, did I fail at the client thing? Like, should I be Mm -hmm. building a client specific business that, you know, like, why can't I scale this thing as large as I want? Why isn't it, you know? And when, when I get stuck there, that's when I emotionally hold on for longer than I should. Mm. And so as I've transitioned, I've learned through the gift of the transitions that letting go makes space for something new. You know, in the design world, like our designers know, like decluttering Mm. is so, I think, emotional and things will just come into your life when you clear out muck, you know? And so as I've wanted to evolve, I've had to clear out muck and not say, oh, I failed at this thing, but this thing has to go so I can open up over here. And that usually means that you have a moment of, you know, I'm picturing a field that gets replanted First, it has to be empty, you know, so you have this moment where the, where the ground is empty and you're like, oh my gosh, what are we planting? We put it all down. And, is it going to come back? And I, I need the fruit. <laughs> um, but it, but there's no other way to, to continue to grow and evolve, you know, um, that's, that's how I've gotten to where I've wanted to be. I love that. You know, it's funny because I just recently interviewed a gentleman, his name is Adam Skugel, and he is from Australia. And he also was in the podcast in the first year. And then I just met him in person. He came to Luann Live in um, Orlando last November 20, uh, 2023. And I interviewed him. And this is a gentleman, Bregan, who has a full-time corporate job. When I interviewed him seven years ago, he had the full-time corporate job. And we had a discussion about, you know, you can do both. You can have your design as a side hustle. My only criteria is that it makes money, right? Um, And then you can still have your job. And then what happened was about two years, I guess it was after I interviewed him, he quote unquote in his mind was like, okay, I'm finally leaving corporate and I'm going to be a designer full time. And what he shared with me just recently on the podcast was that after X amount of three years, I think it was, doing the design full time. He's like, I don't really like this lifestyle. I really don't prefer this. I prefer to have the security of a full time job. And I actually prefer to do two really profitable projects a year. And when one project is done, I'm not like saying to myself, oh my God, when's the next one and the next one? I'm like, oh, maybe I'll take a vacation now or maybe I'll just relax a little bit and rest. And he goes, and the other one will show up and it always does and I'm good. And the point I share that and connect it with you is because he said there was a point when he decided to go back to corporate that he was processing it as a failure, that he couldn't cut it as a full-time designer. And he's past it now. And thankfully, because he just went, he had to work with a coach, you know, who got him past it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No, it's that, that is the biggest mental block. Um, I had two friends that like pick up and move to Nicaragua like five years ago and they started a blog and they were smart because they were like, we're going to do this expat community. We want to open a hotel thing. But instead of going all in, they did a year working for somebody else. Mm. And they came back. And I was so proud of them. Because how hard to tell everybody <laughs> that you're picking up and moving and you're going to open a hotel. But how much bigger does it have to be to come back? And one of the things they shared was our personal relationships, the depth of them didn't satisfy us. We had, we had constant travelers, but we didn't have 
deep friendships and that really weighed on our soul. And we started to almost disconnect from the people that were checking in because we knew it'd be over in a week. And like, how would you know that without experiencing that? You would never, right? You have this glorified version of what it's like to run this beautiful hotel in another country. Right. And then to understand that what fills your soul is meeting and connecting and developing relationships. And you're right. Yeah. It's like to be able to have the strength to pivot, right? The strength and the courage. And also to just, I think when you're an honest person who can learn to live in that vulnerability, it's like they both got their amazing jobs back because they're people who live life honestly, who they welcome them with open arms. Like we want you <laughs> in, in um, you know, I, I think of that often in, in sort of, this mental game that I play with myself and I'm constantly looking for examples and friendships that support the idea that, you know, change is necessary. Love it. I love it. So is there a, a particular moment, lesson, experience in relation to the business and, you know, the stretching of it out of the box or maybe a moment, like you said, a moment where it lasted more than a second where you're like, uh, I planted the stuff, it's not coming up and, you know, we need the results of that crop now. So anything in that, because, you know, like we all have those come to Jesus moments, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, well, I'll tell you two things that, that have been difficult for me. One was um, we really grew um, financially when social media marketing was at the beginning stages. I was I was ready for the yeah, opportunity. Yeah, yeah, I'd been yeah, doing yeah. the content creation. I had been paying <laughs> for video content. And I mean, when I say we raked it in that year in that way, it was like, and this is the easiest job. Well, <laughs> that very quickly switched and advertisers realized they could get a lot done for free product. They realized they could um, pay less to more people. And like overnight, this amazing well that had sprung up really kind of dried up. And, you know, the first things you do is is it me? Is it my content? Mm -hmm. Is it, what am I doing wrong? Do I change? Do I start dancing? Like, you know, how do I keep <laughs> this thing going? And I just, I had to let it go and just go, this is an industry thing. This is advertising companies figuring out what they're going to do. This is television commercials going into social, like nobody's got this figured out. This isn't personal, mm -hmm. but we got to make money. So what are we going right. to do now? You know? Right. Um, and that's when, I mean, to sort of subsidize that, I, I started doing a lot more travel and a lot more in-person speaking events, mm. um, because I try to stay ready, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that was hard. That was hard. And that was a lot of time away from the kids. And that was a, that hard on the body to travel that much, you know? Mm. Yeah. It's exhausting, right? It's, 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 it, mm -hmm. I, I imagine, I don't know if you're similar to me in this regard. It strikes me as you are because your energy also seems high and up. But for me, it doesn't matter if it's two days or 20 days, I'm there the whole time. Like I am able yeah. to jump up and I might, it's not like I don't like hit, you know, get up in the morning and go, you're kidding me on this 10th day. But once I'm up and I'm engaged and there's another person, it's like, bang, 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 bang. You know, my husband, my team, people are just like, my daughter traveled with me. You met her when we were in high point. Yes. And that yes. was like six days. And she's just like, I no. Like, what is it that you eat or drink or smoke that makes you be able to do this? Right. <laughs> and it's just, but the thing is, it is hard. And I have noticed even myself over the last eight years, I used to come back from a seven, eight day stint and you know, full day the next day. Now I still schedule the darn full day, but I'm dragging my butt through it. And so now it's just this year, Regan, that I'm like saying to everybody, schedule me for only time. internal, not high brain activity stuff for one day after a big trip. <laughs> right? Because it's hard. It is hard. So, so I call it being always on. Yeah. Especially because it's a part of my brand. I right. am a part of my brand. So if I show up to that room, I don't get to sit in the corner and, nope. you know, sip a, sip a cocktail and not, not interact. Nope. I have to be always on. Um, 
And that I've had to recognize the the battery does need to power down sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very lucky that it comes naturally, but it is amazing. Like I just actually spent almost uh, four days up in the Malibu mountains at my favorite hotel and felt really guilty about it. But I was like, it's not even February 1st. You've been to <laughs> Europe twice. You've been to Dallas and you've been to a 700 person conference, like two hours from LA. Like, and this I think is you've got January. four days. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can take four days in the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I needed to just, and I was like, oh, th-, and I still go, oh, this is so weird. I'm like, I don't know why I'm tired. And it's like, <laughs> you've crossed the timelines twice in one month. I know. Oh, my goodness. It's true. And I, I understand what you're saying about the always on. Right. And it's funny because I will have people close to me. But like, you know, what? you can you can just come over here and sit. And I'm like, no, I can't. Don't be ridiculous. There's no don't, you don't, don't come if you're not willing to be and talk to the people who help you create what you create when you're content creators like us, you know, whether it's podcasting or for you, it's TV and other things. But that's the whole point. It's like, if you don't want to do it, stay home. Don't, don't show up and not be gracious. Right. So, um, but I'm this, I'm similar like that. Once I'm there, I'm just like, just plug me in. I'm gone. You know, it's good. The second growth pain that I just want to share out of vulnerability is I have the least amount of employees I have ever had. And I am in the most successful place in my career. Mm -hmm. And I didn't um, desire that. I loved having big teams. And I, part of my emotional satisfaction of growing something that has success is to be able to employ women, moms, it just empower people I love, teach them something, let them go discover their thing. And so that was a really hard one for me to make that decision that was right for me and me only kind of like self- mm. it felt selfish, but it's also just something that like nobody tells you. I'm like, wait, how can I be the busiest and most successful, but also have the smallest team I've ever had? Mm. And is it just from a simple business strategy standpoint that the, all the faces and the eyeballs are not necessary and you had to wind yourself around to, like you said, like, how do I restructure this? These are people I care about, the people I love, like... Luckily, luckily, those have sort of happened organically. So okay. you know what I mean. There hasn't been that. There wasn't this huge exodus. Or okay, you didn't have to sit down and say, I'm slashing go. ten people." No. <laughs> yeah, no, that didn't that didn't happen. Um, it happened slowly over time, and I kept thinking, "Okay, we're slowing down to grow again, or we're gonna." I'm gonna, but it just kept kind of, sort of tapering off, and um, I realized I was replacing less and less, and the conversations that I'm having and the individuals that I'm interacting with um, don't need to go through an assistant anymore. They're precious and they're based on my reputation of years that I need to be able to respond as me, not with 10 people in between. And it feels like who I'm connected with are now direct emails to CEOs. Whereas before it was managing product, having somebody pick it up, another person billing it, another person talking to it. Now we're just kind of at a place that I think the compliment is there's not a bunch of middlemen anymore, right. you know, and there, there are relationships that I value that I want to be present for because I want that reflection to, to be able to control it because they're important to me. That's interesting. That's an interesting observation because it does tend to happen as a relationship with any particular other entity is. You typically will evolve higher and higher up the chain to who you're talking with. The more you become important to that entity, the more you value that entity, right? And um, that's an interesting observation on your part. I like that. And so do you, you must still have like an executive assistant to run all the craziness, right? And to get all the coordination with the boys and the airplanes and the 
tutors and all the stuff. No, you're shaking your head. I, no, I can't even. I wish that. I was lying. Oh, I wish I was gosh, lying. God. I have my assistant is seven months pregnant and she works three days a week, uh, four hours at a time. That's Whoa. It. That's all Whoa. we need. Wow. Wow. And those four hours are us on the phone. This, yeah, this, you're this, getting this, it done. This. I'm a verbal, like getting it done. Hey, don't forget, blah, 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 blah. But I, I mean, I'm sure I should reread like the four hour work week. Like <laughs> we are a machine at this point and I am a machine and we check off. Um, the other thing that I am doing is working with a lot more partners. Mm. companies that have their own internal teams. Right. They've got the marketing team. They've got the people who are making the graphics and the, you know, the, the email sequences and the social media posts and stuff. Right. And, and then also having more contract employees, okay. meaning um, people with their own graphics design companies mm-hmm. who I hire their company to help me with X thing. Um, more, you know, even just in my building and contracting space, more professionals with their own companies who I might be exchanging monetary value for something they're adding, but they're not a direct employee anymore. Right. It's, right. it's, it's a company that will be fine with or without me. Yes. Yes. You're not, you're not the responsibility of their um, livelihood is not on you. It's funny because I think, um, you know, my company is, is similar in that I've got uh, one, two, three, I think three of us are full time paid, you know, on the books employees, but the other 11 are contractors. And, but you know, and yeah. some of them are full time at my disposal, you know, that are my people. Right. But, um, yep. It, yep. it does make a difference. And what I love about it is and the way I've utilized it is, and I think you alluded to it is I'm going directly for a superpower. I'm not looking for somebody who can this, 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 and this, and do all of them okay. I'm looking for you do this amazing, you write amazing. Well, then you come with me, please, and be a copywriter. You create graphics amazing. So then you come with me and be my graphics person. You are a great website person, Nicole Heimer. You do that. Yeah, exactly. um, and then that way you get superpowers all around. You get leveled up all yep. around, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Totally. Interesting. You know, it's funny because I did want to just go back to that, how you said the switch from, it was basically you got into the paid influencer um, on social at the right time. Like you were ready for it. You worked for it. Um, And it just went from them having an understanding of we're paying for this. And then the, the, the morph of it was, huh, we, there's lots of people that will do this for product. Like you're paying bills. You're not looking for, you know, a, a pots and pans in the mail. right? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Personally. Yeah. I mean, just where well, that's where my business is. I don't, I don't have that ability and uh, I have to value my content creation because it's what pays the bills. Yeah. 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 And, and you know what, it's, it's, I love the lesson to be able to step back and just say, no, it's not that I'm not, you know, valuable or needed or wanted or worthy. It's that business model changed and I could change with it, but I don't, that doesn't work for me. I don't want that. So like, okay, let's create a different lane for you and your company. Right. Yep. And, yeah. I, and it's also, I've always think, seen things as possible options. You know, I'm mm. like, for example, one of the things that was popular for six, eight months that my manager would say is like, they want really organic content. You talking to the camera, you walking around. And I was just like, but that's not, I don't want to live that life. I mm. like making polished content months in advance. I like it being up to this level. I want to stay at this level for the hosting TV shows or the, you know, just that's, I wanted polished content. Now, not knocking those who are walking around just doing organic content. That is a whole different job and a whole nother way of, you know, of doing content creation, but it wasn't organic to me. And I think the more we change to fit other people's things, the more we lose ourselves and we lose our value. Yeah. I love that observation as well. I mean, that takes courage for us to just say, 
that's great. That's what you want, but it's not what I want to do. It doesn't feel great to me. It's not the way I want to do it. And I love that you separate the different type of content because it's true. There's a place for that. Hey, I'm putting on my shoes and getting a latte. Like, I don't know who watches it, but lots of people yeah. do. Literally thousands and thousands I of people I watch it. Do. I watch <laughs> it. <laughs> I'm just sitting there going, what? Like, I think I'm just the wrong generation. However, you know, like you said, your brand, what's important to you is a level of production and content. And I never watch your content and feel like I'm, I'm going to just say it. I never feel like I'm wasting my time. That's, that's what it is. I just, it feels like I'm in your life. Like we're much better friends in real life than you actually know, because I feel like I really know you. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's what I want. Yeah. I feel like I'm in your life. I feel like I know your two boys. I think they're just like ridiculously adorable. Um, but it doesn't have that. Um, I, I never really thought about that way. I really never really noticed that it is feeling lifestyle, but it is all produced. It's, I it like is, it. It is my camera guy who's been with me for years now. And uh, we film probably once every three months. Um, and then we split up the content. Like all that designer react stuff that people don't even notice, but it is such a part of why I'm able to grab the opportunities that I have. The yeah. designer reacts doesn't need to be successful, but I have to constantly be telling a story of who I am, who my personality is and what the brand stands for and what that looks like. And so when you think about that calendaring, so every three months you guys basically have the shoots and stuff. And is it, Three days it, of it, it five varies. days of it. Yeah. No, so so um in December we shot a hundred designer reacts episodes at a studio. Wow. And you probably don't even notice, but twice a week I'm reacting to other people's social media videos of design. And it's an uh, it's kind of a foolproof way to introduce my personality. You know what I right. mean? Because my reactions are my reactions. Right. Um but I had my stylist and makeup girl on set and we changed my outfit every three videos. Wow. And that to me is sustainable content creation that speaks to my brand ethos, but doesn't overtake my life on a daily basis. Wow. You know, what's interesting about that is my, at first I'm sitting here thinking how, um, complimentary I'm thinking about the efficiency of it to your point. We're going to get together. We're going to do a hundred, you know, videos. We're going to change the outfit every three times. But when I actually then went to a hundred different videos mentally, now are you, is somebody storyboarding them out for you ahead of time? Because mentally, are you just like the 15th time? I'm like, I don't know what I, my reaction is to this. <laughs> like, it seems like it's a reaction to the same one as I had before. <laughs> And then you, and then you've got to be grateful for the team who's like, let me touch up your under eyes. Wait, your shirt is wrong. Let's yeah. flip your hair. And John, you know, John, I know, and I trust him as a professional to cut out the one where I'm like, John, I don't know what to say anymore. You know right. what I mean? And that's where like my hair and makeup girl is like, did you notice the weird plant in the corner? I'm like, oh, thank you. Like, is that her job? No, right. but right. but we're a team trying to just get it done. But yeah, that's another one where like. The day before, I'm like, okay, tomorrow's 100 episodes. And then I kind of have to have two <laughs> days off. But I rather I rather do that and then be able to spend a month. You know, the kids and I sneak away every month for the last seven years almost to Spain. Wow. And part of the reason I can do that is because everything for that month is already programmed in the system. So I wow. rather take the maximalist day and be able to sneak away and nobody knows. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. So give me a little bit of that CEO strategy, that CEO scheduling, that CEO discipline there of planning out. Like you said, when you're assistant, she's four hours, but you're bang, bang, bang for four hours. I mean, are you... Is Are you like the night before it's your day with your assistant? Are you preparing and you've got an outline? Or are you just brain dumping and then she processes? Like, get me into how Both. you go from do you know thinking about and getting it all done efficiently um i think that 
uh, it's all about simplicity. Like I remember sitting with my my dad on the way to school and he would always have this legal pad on um, the armrest next to him. And he would have like, you know, it would be like one third of the way down. And as we were driving, he would call the person on the top, cross it out. And 90% of the time, I would watch him cross it out with one line and add two down below. And then cross out a line and add two down below. And I remember at that time in high school being like, my dad doesn't work. Like he just, he's on the phone. What's his job? You know, like my other friends, parents were nurses or these very like, you know, tactile jobs. And I was like, my dad just talks on the phone. Like (laughs) that job. (laughs) Right. Well, the hardest job. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, Right. But I think I subconsciously picked up on the simplicity of those systems. It's like problem solution. I have, I share everything in notes um, with my assistant and we have her list and then we have my list. And then I also need to verbal through my schedule, like uh, three, you know, what do we have going on in the next three weeks? Okay, what's today? What's tomorrow? What's Tuesday? But then also what's next week? What's the week after? I have, it's basically just all lists and it's lists of goals. It's lists of things I have to do. It's lists of things I can get to when I am done with the have to list. Um, But it is all lists. Even the kids and I, we do a, we do a goal list every year, Wow! right around the new year. What are your goals for this year? And what are some of the goals that the boys come up with? Um, My younger son wants to ski more. And Mm -hmm. so, like, as a mom, I'm like, ooh, I got to find a way to do that because that is not something I excel at. (laughs) Um, I I could pull it up. Um, And it's always fun then to re-look back at it and be like, oh, we accomplished all of these things. Um, My son wants to be more mature. He wants to be cleaner. (sighs) He wants to not be scared of monsters. And he wants to do more skiing. And how old is this um, one? Which is, is this like older this or younger? This one's eight. Okay, okay. Eight. He's, he's the younger one. He wants and, to be uh, more he's mature. And he's my messy child. More he wants mature. to be more mature and cleaner. That's it's adorable. So cool. And cleaner. <laughs> um, my other son, because sometimes they inform each other and we do it all together. He wants to see the snow, but he's not interested in skiing. <laughs> um, he really wants a Timbuktu bag. Um, and he wants to be more responsible. Um, and then sometimes, so this was this year's goals, last year's goals, like my son wanted to go to New York. I had the opportunity to take him. He wanted to go to the Santa Monica pier. You know, I can kind of help inform them at this young age. Like, yes. Oh, if we set goals, they happen. The magic <laughs> is mom. <laughs> um, my son's goal last year was he wanted a hundred more dollars. And like, that was something this year where we were like, you didn't get there, did you, buddy? He's like, no, but he's eight. And uh, he's just really like, he loses his Christmas money and he spends it. And like, he's always misplacing, (laughs) like, you know? And so we were like, okay, so we continue that goal on. Like one day you will have a hundred dollars. One day. It's not this year, but one day. I just love it. I just love it. I just, um, you know, the, 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 the life lessons that you are teaching your kids on the regular are just so incredible that they are watching their mom, who is this powerhouse and that is creating this life of her dreams and is sitting down and writing her goals and reverse engineering them, you know, and, and when you are, Because a lot of times the kids are involved. So is it the type of thing now that we know it's not like, you know, just organic and impromptu? um, Is it with the kids happening on vacation and it's like you're like, okay, this is a good thing? Or is it like we're getting the kids and we're putting them together for a couple of days and we're going to do some shoots and then they're off for the month too? Like, because they're they're part of your brand. You know what I mean? Like they're part of you. Well, that, but also part of it is like, so it's a little bit of everything. I also really do like photography and putting memories into 
a capsule like that. Um, you know, I've been terrible at keeping journals for my kids or all the lovely things I thought I would do when they were babies. Oh, right. My but first wh- grade picture and my teeth came out this day. <laughs> This mom doesn't have any of that. And and I tried to put it on Nana. I was like, can you keep one? And she's like, no, not my responsibility. So um, I basically buy a photo book every year that's like of wedding photo album quality that won't, you know, age, it won't whatever. And I'm doing two stacks of them for each kid for all 18 years. Their memories. That's amazing. But out of guilt and the inability to do it on a daily basis, I'm like, okay, I got to have something for you when I die. All right. You each get a photo book for every year of your life. Like this is, this is what mom can contribute. But that's a big deal though. I have to tell you that even the commitment to do it each year, you know, like it's look, any one of us has been a mother has done the, I'm going to do this every year for my kid. And then like one year later, you're like, yeah, I missed a year. Then it's five years. <laughs> Well, luckily, we take enough photos every year <laughs> to fill a book. And I think it's only like 50 pictures, but it's that really nice paper. I mean, it's that really wedding yes. quality. And then I have a photographer that knows that I want it every year and is very happy to remind me that we need to do this year's book. And oh, so, that's awesome. Uh, building a team looks different all the time. Yeah, I love that. I love that. That's so good. And do you want to talk at all about the philanthropy that you do with their your organization in Africa? It's the Makuno Project. And then also yes, you have the school that. there that you have has helped establish. You want to talk about that at all? So, yeah, and it's actually multiple schools. And I'm going to pull up um, some stats for you, I think, Mm. if I can find it quick enough, Um, because it's been really exciting what we've been able to do. And I think those always help sort of inform what's actually going on. Um, And of course, I can't pull them up, but I will find them. Um, So basically, I have been involved... um, I've wanted to fix the world since I was really, really young. And I was given the opportunity, again, through my parents, to really visit orphanages when I was eight, to um, go on a micro-loans tour of Costa Rica when I was 11 and bring Mm. a friend. But we're going into these homes where um, they're being given a business loan, and then they pay it back, and then the loan lives on. So, like, this idea of tithing, has been a part of my upbringing. Mm. Um, And that used to feel very burdensome. And I wanted to fix the world. And Mm. it was um, my dad who sat me down and was like, you can't fix the world. I'm like, what do you mean I can't fix the world? You're the one who inspired me to want to do it, right? (laughs) He's like, but you can fix something for somebody somewhere. Like, I know that without a doubt. And I was like, oh. And so I got very intentional with what my cause was going to be um, because I'm like, if I have a cause, you have a cause, she has a cause. Now we're fixing the world. Yes. And what spoke to me really was these girls in Kenya. And a lot of it is child marriage at eight. They're sold off literally for cows. They don't put them in school, you know, education They're They underestimate women, I think, on the most barbaric levels. And so one of the things we're really fighting is also FGM, which is Mm. female cutting, which happens at eight. And it's uh, dangerous, non-sanitary, emotionally horrible. Um, But the way the way you combat it is by going, hey, give we'll pay for her to go to school and watch what happens. And the whole community changes. I mean, it is insane. It's like going to a desert and all of a sudden just this spring pops out when you stop underestimating half your population. It is amazing. And giving them tools to succeed, it's amazing how everything thrives. And, um, are you saying that it's changing from within the community? In other words, The community who is friendly to these young girls is the one that's approving and allowing and this is happening. But then when you prove to them that with education, this young girl becomes a positive member and somebody that impacts things in in an important or in in a positive way, 
then the community itself is like, let's stop doing this. Whoa. Exactly. Whoa. But, but also, also more, uh, you know, all encompassing. So yes. like when we're starting in a new area, one of the things we do is get together and ask them, who are your leaders? We'd like to have a meeting. <laughs> and they, they, you know, provide their leaders. Um, by the way, all this work in Kenya is being staffed by Kenyans who grew up in these areas. This isn't us. Like what, like people, when I go, they're like, oh, you're helping. I'm like, I'm not helping. I'm asking the hard questions and I'm seeing what the funds are doing. I'm not implementing any of the work, you know? Um, it is them that are that are creating these changes. So, and then you you get them in a group together and you go, so what problems do you guys have? And how do we solve them? You know what I mean? And whether it's, you know, we really have no water, but one of the ones that comes out and most fathers don't want is this cutting. I mean, it is just brutal. And I so have So who's sat doing on it and who's beds. wanting it then? If the fathers aren't, the mothers can't be wanting it. I mean, is it just it's generationally, I, it's, in, in, it's like a custom, it's a ritual, it's a thing? Like, it's I being like, afraid of change. Oh it's my being, it, it is just, and it's, it's by the way, women and grandmothers who do the cutting, which like even finding that part out as I <laughs> get more into this and learn more, I'm like, wait, what? Like I'm picturing some hugely barbaric man pinning down this girl. And it's like, no, it's her grandmother. Um. Yeah, it's just very interesting how people are afraid of change and questioning the whys. And when you and just give not them knowing space, any different. This is just what it's been done for years and years and years and years and generations. And this my is mom did it, so I did it, so right. we're going to do it. Well, and by the way, Even in our own lives with way less dramatic things, we do the same thing, right? Exactly. Generational chaos. <laughs> I'm well, sure I mean, we got like some right. with the boys. And the thing is, it, positively too, right? Like you described how it's your parents who instilled in you this spirit of helping the world. So that's a positive yeah. thing. And you're doing it to your right. children. Your children are learning it right. right through you. You're not like, hey, mom's going to go volunteer and change the world over here. I'll, back, I'll be back to go to McDonald's with you. You're like, they're living the life with you. But it's just, I think naively, we want to think that something that horrific has to not be condoned by the people in the community. It feels like you said, some guy is barging in and like doing this. Whoa, I just learned something today. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And so it, it's amazing because, um, you know, Makuna is partnered with other um, charities that are bigger and we are able to sort of all create this change and then do it in a way that we've scaled the thing and you're going into areas where it's a hundred percent cutting and you get it down to less than one percent and wow. then you grow and then you, we still go back and address that one percent by the way and why and then we keep scaling it so the the goal is to really um, solve the problem in Kenya first. And then my goal would be, okay, this happens all over the world. FGM is legal in the United States. Whoa. It is um, a parent's right. Uh, there, was, there was a case, and I don't have all the specifics in front of me, but there was a big case a few years ago that uh, went to the state's uh, Supreme Court, like not the, and they basically said, we can't tell a parent what they can do with their child. And um, wow. it remains legal here. Wow. It's That's not crazy. happening here right. all the it's time. It's not the custom here, right. Also, um, you know, not, not that it's any better, but it's usually, you know, surgical and anesthesia and, and, and there it's under a tree and, and, and oh. not that this should be happening anywhere, right? In either case, but, it's but just, one is really dangerous people, in all the other ways, the immediate ways of infection and, and trauma and all yeah. of that. Yeah. 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 And well, it's just funny because people are just like over there, that problem. And I'm like, oh yeah, but by the way, like we still do it here. It happens in the Middle East a lot. It It is a, it is a global issue where I'm focused in on one area to figure out how to solve it here. And then my goal is to take that um, and figure out how to solve it globally. Duplicate it. Right. 
have the have mm-hmm. have it be the impact the other way. We don't do this here and anymore. learn learn from people who have. Like I remember yeah. just internet stalking this guy that really um, ran a successful campaign in London through colleges on eliminating it uh, in England. And it was so successful that when I finally got him on the phone and he's like, who are you? And I was like, who are you? But I need to know who you are because you I'm an interior designer in LA. LA. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and we're still friends and he still reaches out. And, um, you know, that's that vulnerability too, that I just try to have like, Hey, I need help. Um, but he was like, yeah, basically we did it and we ran this campaign and it was so successful. we I don't have to focus on it right now. The, the, the colleges took over it and, um, and their way of solving it was talking about it. Yes. That well, that's it what became, it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, you have to know more than just the headlines. Like me, I just know the headlines. And now you're telling me some of these, you know, ridiculous nuances that my like, grandmothers are doing it to the, it's just, wait, what? You know? Mm-hmm. So, so my question is, was like you said, when your dad said, You know, I I wrote it down because it was so good. You can fix something for someone somewhere. I love that. Your dad Mm -hmm. sounds like an amazing guy. I remember that our first interview, talking more about your parents and being very impressed by them. Um, So did you, with this in mind, there's people listening that you're inspiring, that they're like, you know what? I feel really passionate about X, Y, Z cause. And is it that we have to go start this thing or like Makuna, did you start it or you decided this was no. your cause and you found them and you just became important and an impetus for them? Yes, that second one. And okay. it's uh, Makuna is led by Margot Day. Margot Day is an ex-Microsoft executive who is brilliant, who um, really started a lot of this work in Kenya when she stumbled on a rescue center in 2011. Um, and I just started getting more and more and more involved. Hey, Marco, it's been that, that, <laughs> Exactly. And, and luckily Marco is like, Hey, I need help. You know, yeah. I, I can use people who are passionate about this and, and, um, yeah. Yeah. I so love that. right now the Makuno board does not include me. Um, I'm more of an advocate of theirs. And she's like, do you want, I'm like, no, I want to be what I am, the branding voice. But in terms of all of the nuts and bolts and the 501c3 and everything, like they, they are much better at that part of it. Right. Well, and I love that because that makes it feel like something each of us can aspire to do then, right? Because, you know, you might have said, oh, yeah, I invented it and I started it and I've got the 501C. Like, there's a lot of people that do do that, like Margot Day, right? And and then there's uh-huh. something about that is like, okay, I probably don't have the bandwidth or the intelligence or the connections to do that. So then we go back to doing nothing as opposed to Mm -hmm. what I love is find something that you can sink your teeth into and see if somebody out there is doing it and could use your help, right? Yeah. Yeah. And this year, actually, um, we're going to, I'm going to dedicate a lot more time to helping tell the stories online because it is insane what $25 will bring a girl in that area and I think when you can tell that story um, it does make people feel like they have an ability to create change even though they're not there or they're not traveling with you but we need that we need that help yeah 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 that's that's incredible I love that that's so amazing Oh my goodness. You would just are, you know, it's just so fun. And, you know, probably another few years, we're going to have to do this again and see what your next iteration is and what the next next risk was that felt scary to do. Um, But in the meantime, it's such a pleasure and a joy to know you and to watch you do your life and, and all the ways that you, yeah, it it really is. um, I I think, you know, it's funny because a lot of people make a choice for their own good, valid reasons um, not to bring their children into their public life. Um, But it, you know, for you, it works. And for your family, it works. Um, And then just as the person watching, it just consistently re- 
Reed reminds me of the actual real human person that you are. It's like, oh yeah, she's a mom. These kids are probably off camera fighting right now, but they're going to be fine and lock it down. And then they're all going to have an ice cream. You know what I'm saying? It's uh... a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, we, we, we try our best, but we, we try to show the real sides too, so that it feels authentic, oh, yeah. you know, um, and that it is authentic and it's, and it's achievable. Yeah. Um, I'm going to give you these stats real fast because oh, I found yeah. them. Oh, good. So Makuno Mac sent 256 girls to school for a year with our scholarships. We paid for 23 teachers' salaries for three months. Um, that was sort of an immediate need. Um, we, 85 rescue girls, we were able to provide personal support to. We did four college scholarships, and we sent two boys to um, one year of secondary school, and hopefully they will continue on. Um, and that was just Makuna. We're working with bigger partners out there who are doing more. And uh, I think I personally was able to help Makuno raise only like $10,000 last year. Um, you know, this isn't crazy, unachievable numbers, wow. but the effects are giant. That I mean, is that's also like 300 people. That's 300 people somewhere. That's right. 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 To your dad, 300 people that you were to fix something for somewhere. Right. That's amazing. Yep. Congratulations. Congratulations, really, Again, you know, of um, making it a priority in your life and, and living the values that your parents taught you. You know, um, it's it's incredible. You know, I appreciate you so much. I appreciate you taking the time to be here today with me and sharing your thoughts Same. and your insights. You know, it's awesome. Same. It is great. It's always a fun time. I appreciate you letting me go. Lana, we got stuff to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Regan. All right. It's so interesting to learn how Bregan has done everything, right? Professionally, personally, um, with her philanthropy, how intentional it's all been, right? How about creating a year's worth of blog posts before she launches the website? That takes a tremendous amount of discipline. But because she had her goal in mind, she set out on the path and she knew what she needed to do and she didn't let anything deter her from doing it in the way she believed was the way to success, right? Because as you heard, Bregan reverse engineers her career. She reverse engineers her goals. She looks at the people who are successful in the things that she would like to do, like Martha Stewart and others that are in licensing. She notices the elements, the criteria, the things that were in place in those careers of the people she aspires to be like. And then she finds that way to build it for herself. What she found was that most of these, many of these had TV exposure and that helped them build their audience and building the audience was a key component to some of these other things that she wanted, the licensing and so forth. So she went around and did that. She didn't wish for it. She did it. Bregan also has a willingness to learn from others and she realizes that shifting gears is risky, but she's learned not to be afraid to say, I don't know. What would you suggest? How do you think about this? What can you show me about it, right? She also has trusted her own instincts about what was right for her, despite whether it was popular to do, like her social media content. She shares the behind the scenes, but for her, what feels right for her is that it is still polished. It's not off the cuff. This is right for many. We 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 know them. We watch them. But she, when she sees what others are doing, like that reverse engineering, and she knows what she wants to aspire to be like, you see the critical thing here that Bregan is doing. She's still processing it through her own instincts, through what is right for her, okay? This is an example of making your own lane when something that someone else is doing doesn't feel right. You have to listen to your inside voice. You know what's best for you. You just need to hear it. And then you have to be brave enough to take the action on it, like Bregan does. As you shift in your business, you will have your own come to Jesus moments and lessons. And I know I say it a lot, but it bears repeating because 
Bregan is the poster child for this saying. You have to be prepared to be lucky, right? Being lucky is a real thing. It really is. But being prepared to be lucky is really the real thing. Being available and prepared for the opportunities you want. Consider all the different ways that you can go after what you want and what you could do and what leads to that opportunity. And do those, right? And then lastly, the Makuna Project. Huge respect for getting involved in a cause that resonates with her values and for shining the light on people who are the ones with the boots on the ground doing the work. That's the way she shows up and she makes impact, right? She found something that meant something to her and she supports the people who are doing the work in the Makuna Project. It's a, it's a excellent way to consider philanthropy, right? And I love her dad's advice. You can't fix the world, but you can fix something for someone somewhere. How ridiculously inspiring is that, right? Bregan, I appreciate you. I appreciate your friendship and I appreciate you for coming back onto the show and sharing your insights with us. Pretty sure we're gonna have to make this like every three or four year thing so that we can keep keeping up with the way you keep shifting and taking those risks and creating the next version of your life and your success. In the meantime, I'm sending you all the love, lady, for all the things that you want in your life. And thank you for listening. I appreciate that you show up too. Decide to be excellent. Thank you for joining me today. This podcast is a production of Luann Nigara Inc. If you want to know more about me, my books, or Luann University, go to luannnigara.com. And if you are interested in having Window Works help you with your next window treatment or awning project in the New York, New Jersey metro area, go to windowworksnj.com to learn more. Have an excellent day.